My name is Justin Gage, and you're tuned in to the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast with your host, Jason Woodbury. You're suggesting the transmission is meant for a life form other than man. At least a possibility, Admiral. When you catch a light, you look like your mother. It crushes me some. Just right from the side When you catch the light There's a flash of wild creatures For the stone age of the preachers And the husbands and the wives Greetings and welcome to Transmissions. Why do we need to ever specify something as supernatural? Nature and its doings are already the zenith. Nine-tenths of it are beyond the realm of scientific understanding and explanation. Nature is big budget and shocking. Natural is getting your first period. Natural is guinea worms coming out of the bottoms of your feet. Natural is bioluminescence and volcanoes. Natural is head lice. That's a quote from our guest this week on Transmissions, Nico Case. She's recently launched Entering the Lung, a newsletter of her inspired nature writing. And as you'll hear in this conversation, her view is sort of that everything is is nature and everything is natural. I don't need to tell you that Nico Case is a a great writer. Her work with the new pornographers, Case Lang, Veers, and her solo albums demonstrate that evidently. But it is deeply nice to be able to appreciate her on prose terms via the newsletter. She's a great artist, and benefiting her sense of humor, we let this talk wander. One more note before we get into it. If you're a supporter of Aquarium Drunkard on Patreon, you've already heard an extended and unedited version of this talk. We posted it up early for our patrons, and this week we'll have another advanced listen uh, podcast in the pipeline, my conversation with Steve Berlin of Los Lobos. You'll be able to hear it in a few weeks here in the regular feed, but you'll be able to hear it this coming Monday if you head over to Patreon and pledge your support for this independently produced podcast. All right, thanks so much. Here we go. Nico Case, this is Transmissions. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll speak with you more on the other side. There's no mother's hands to quiet me. I wrote down in my notes in my notes it just says poop is the great equalizer which is a quote from one of your uh one of your 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 essays which is a good quote because it's true um but beyond that I'm just thinking about you're a, you're a writer because you're a songwriter and that's a writing practice that involves mm-hmm. all the same stuff that writing essays does editing rough drafts revision all that crying. stuff crying crying <laughs> yeah we open openly weeping Sob things like that crying yeah <laughs> but have you enjoyed settling into this sort of more formalized writing writing practice and and is this going to become a book because it seems like it should be a book i am going to work on writing a book um the substack thing is not necessarily going to be a book but it's still there like it doesn't go mm-hmm. away and it's really yeah. nice. I own it all. You know, that's one of the really cool things about it. Um, oh, I just had something really good to say and then I just lost it. Um, <laughs> we were talking about... Poop? Is crime, it related poop. to... Well, no? I have been thinking a lot about poop lately, actually, because I've been obsessed with the Victorian era of British colonialism and in turn, you know, the quote unquote new world colonialism and... Maybe yeah. that's why poop is so frowned upon because class upper class people don't like to be reminded of poop because I mean it's stinky whatever sure but because they're like oh, we do indeed shit and you do indeed shit and it does indeed the lord god himself would admit the shitting holes on both of us are <laughs> the same sizes and therefore whereins there art thou and it would be a problem more so than the smell. Yeah. Is this what you've been studying? <laughs> you a, mentioned you've been studying. Is this it? I, is this, it, is, is this it is a lot of what I study. 
and I really enjoy it. Um, yeah. But I'm angry most of the time because I study really hard about the shit that's wrong. And I think that's absolutely uh, appropriate. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, well, clearly, uh, it, there's so much. It's so easy to look at all of the things that are wrong. That was another thing that the last year really helped to bring into sharp relief, which was that if, if you're the kind of person, and I think we all can be this kind of person on occasion, who's like, it's probably not that bad, but like last year it was kind of hard to stick with that one, you know? Because it, it was that bad. In fact, it was probably worse than I, you know, than I was thinking. Um, but, but yeah, it's a weird year to have to stop and take stock of, of all the things that are happening but it doesn't sound like it, it sounds like this is like this newsletter is born out of a, a continuing process of you thinking about things and wanting to put things out into the world and write stuff is that i mean it, it was 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 this a thing where you're like i feel like now i know what i want to say or is writing it how you figure out what you want to say i think it's that i think it's the latter because i can i can whip out a outline in five minutes and I never stick to it. I never start at the beginning. I never go chronologically. Like I just can't stick to that pattern. I'm too, I have like really bad ADHD. So I just, I start wherever there's a place to start or it's any spark. I'll take it because I also procrastinate really hard and, and I get that that really weird fear that you get when you have a really nice new notebook of really beautiful pristine paper in front of you and you don't want to fuck it up you're like yeah, look I at this that. beautiful gorgeous thing somebody worked to make this and i'm going to write a bunch of dumb crap on it mm-hmm. which is very valid and there's other ways to do it but it's also it's a really easy way to be scared to start something and i feel that the argument of well, it's not it's not real. One person can't make a difference. It's just all corporations. It's like, no, it's just you trying to sound smart and it sucks and it it's the most diff- it's like all you're yeah. doing is towing the company line by being a know-it-all who says, eh, "Really? Just it all sucks. It doesn't matter." The recycling yeah. doesn't get recycled anyway. Right. Well, then what the fuck are you going to do about it? Are you going to just fucking make that face at me? Or are you going to like <laughs> research recycling? Like what actually does get recycled? Because like that is one of the most important questions ever. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. we got to deal with it. We can't just, you know, I I was in d- there. Like there's this thing in Chicago where you had to buy these blue garbage bags to put your recycling in. And I refuse to believe that they were not recycling the blue bags for years after I knew damn well they were not recycling the blue bags. Right, because it right. hurt too much. Like it broke my heart too much that they wouldn't. But yeah. it was a big scandal. And it's like, if somebody can shiv you and take the money, mm, they're probably gonna do it. It's so right. easy. It's such it's so its own reward when you never see the end of the chain, you know? But luckily, you know, most things are built on cycles, not on linear chains of events. And we yeah. have that going for us. So that's a super vague way to describe how I think we're going to solve everything um, because I don't have any of the answers. But I do have a different way of thinking that I think might help like three other people. Well, yeah, I think I get I get what you're saying, and I I think that um, and it's not like I just I just was saying it like this is my system to weight <laughs> loss or like this is your this is a way of getting a secure retirement nest egg by the time you're 42 years old. I, I just sounded like the biggest. Can I say the word cunt on the? I sounded yeah. like a huge cunt just now. You can say yeah, you can. But say that. I am so hot right now that it. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm not my best me, but I could still be the sassiest me. Maybe that's no, that's great. But I think that <clears throat> you're saying you're saying something that's like really interesting to me because the know-it-alls who tell us that you know it doesn't matter and that things are screwed up, hopelessly screwed up, right? 
there's a part of me that, of course, understands sort of where they're coming from because it's really hard not to feel that way. But there's another part of me that thinks that we almost have to have, we have maybe even a responsibility to imagine that things could turn out some way other than oh, yeah. terrible. We absolutely and, have that responsibility. And <clears throat> that responsibility, I think, starts with, you know, it's like a map. It's like you find yourself on a map and you're like, what, what is my relationship to everything that's happening around me? And, you know, right. I can only make the map for me because I'm me and I'm a, you know, settler, colonialist, white lady born here in the United States of America. Um, uh, I work a lot of jobs. Um, I consume things. I buy things. I sell things. Yeah. I eat and drink things. Uh, like every single thing I do all day long has an impact on something else, even if it's a little thing. And this is the most boring. It's like how Christmas is the greatest story ever told. It's like, this is the most boring story I ever told. <laughs> There's And like, I don't know exactly how to break through the blandness of the most boring story ever told, but I think it starts with actually researching whose mm -hmm. land you live on. Like, who was here first? Like for me, I live here in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, which was, um, you know, the Nulhegan band of the Kalasuk Abenaki people mm -hmm. are here. And um, so I decided to look into how people used to do things here. And, and you know, I found out very quickly, oh, those, those people are not gone. Those right. people are here and yeah. everywhere and still do things uh, still know how to do a lot of things in a way that was good for the world like it wasn't yeah. even stuff that was no impact but but doing things in a way that actually benefited other things and it, it's such a i, th I think i i'm just gonna have to go to to the like i think my moment of you know i've always been looking for this moment of not feeling that cynical, well, the recycling doesn't get recycled anyway, feeling of like people should just go extinct. Like, I don't right. want people to like l go through a horrible apocalypse, but you know, a kind soft extinction would be nice for the world. And I read, like, I really love gardening and nature and I, I can't get enough. So I read this really incredible book called um, Braiding Sweetgrass by this incredible woman named Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a, a scientist and she's also of the Potawatomi Nation. And she lives in upstate New York, which um, I'm not exactly what sure, sure what territory she lives in there, but she's lived all over the United States and traveled around the world. And she talks about how there are certain species of plants that rely on us to move them and touch them and how it could not exist without us. And it's a, a reciprocal relationship. And we mm. only ever think about ourselves as like these apex predator kick ass, you know, like we don't belong in nature. And, and that's where a lot of the Victorian research comes in. Like, yeah, yeah. they were, they were trying as hard as they could to, distance us from poop and nature and animals because we are separate from that and that mythology you know was about making sure that rich people kept their money and yeah. i a, a lot of people i i don't want to come at it like it was a religious thing because some people did genuinely love the god that they that they love like god and jesus christ and all these all all these other things that were really important to them and hold sacred and I don't want to be shitty about that because there's some really cool things in that ideology but Victorian England was using it for some of the worst crimes against the world and it, it it's it's yeah, I think it's like the 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 most the closest big beating heart, big bang of like cruelty to us, that Victorian era. Um, it's so funny sure. that people are, are always 
or when I was a kid, I was like, God, no, women don't rule stuff. And people were always saying, girls can't do that. Women can't do that. And they literally would say it like that. But Victoria gained the most territory of any avaricious colonial ruler in the history of humankind, this yeah. woman. And she didn't do it alone. She had a lot of help. But yeah. we are all capable of this really, I don't know. I guess that's one of the things. Colonialism right now where we stand is so easy. So yeah. easy. And yeah. back to Robin Wall Kimmerer, she, I, I believed her. And from my actual experience of like going out and being with plants and animals and looking at them and traveling and meeting people and looking at art and thinking about things and hearing music, I was, I believed her and the way she put it all together, it finally made sense to me. So I owe her my life in a way because I would have wow. lived out the rest of my life. And maybe I would have come to that realization on my own, but I doubt it. I am not a botanist. I don't, I don't have that background. Um, so I, I, I thank her a little bit. I, I kind of go a little overboard, but it's a pretty huge idea to yeah. think that you actually belong in the world and that your moving body, your life, your breathing, your eating, your sleeping, your pooping affects the molecules around you even if nothing else like but it does it really affects yeah. things we murmurate like birds we yeah. we are incredible we're an incredible species like let's look at us like the planet earth version of what yeah. the cool shit is we could do like run 50 miles an hour you know we right. can't we can't do that but um there there are lots of books about what humans can do that is really cool um, well, yeah, and, like and also there's there's also so many ideas or questions if we even know the limits of what humans can do in so many ways, which is yeah. a whole a whole other thing. But it's funny. I, but it's you know, not I about wrote, millionaires going to space. Like it's little tiny ideas that are the real I, ones. I, I wrote I mean, down. If we I could get down, them into space faster, that would be better. <laughs> well, it's so funny. I'll give ten dollars. <laughs> We'll start a GoFundMe. Uh, yeah. It's the only way that it's the only way that uh, vast sums of money can be accrued at this point. <laughs> Rocket if you're that not with shit. one of those guys. <laughs> but then we're just gonna pollute the universe. But yeah, I, I wrote. Know. But it's so funny. I wrote down in my notes. I wrote, you know, uh, th this is these are my unedited notes. It's, I wrote nature versus us, comma we are nature. Dot go to space question mark. We're in space. <laughs> um, so it's funny that you brought this up because. That's something that I've been but, thinking a lot about, right? But, it's, yeah, it's, and that's the cycle thing. It's like, oh, yeah, we're already there. Okay, it's <laughs> it's these stupid notions that are totally in our way. And yeah, I'm the, way, go the to ways space. to <laughs> be, like, we just expect it to be some huge revelation or something. I think that's why it's so hard to accept. But yeah, Robin and, Wall Kimmerer are talking about sweet grass and the way it lives and the way it reproduces and the way it abides made total sense to me i was like i get yeah. it now thank yeah. you for everything you do and i think i want to take that and i am not a botanist and i'm not i'm not gifted in that way and i don't know you know i don't i don't have this incredible indigenous wisdom that can help people figure out how to save plants really quickly or even slowly um, but there are people who do, thank goodness, yeah. and we need to listen and we need to support them and fund them and make them our leaders. And we need to, yeah, to listen. Oh, listening is so hard. Resting is hard. Listening is hard. There's some of the hardest two fucking things ever. And I That's am not any good at either one of them. But I got a little bit done trying to do them. So I'm like, okay, I got a little bit done trying to do them. So if I just yeah. keep trying, more and more stuff will get done. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know what the end goal is that I have here. I just know that maybe if we look at ourselves in a slightly different way that's kinder and more curious and a lot less... Um, I guess 
I can't th- like I can't think of the right terminology, but you know, there's so much going on right now. There's so many incredible conversations being had about what humans are about. Yeah. You know, the the thing I think of immediately is like gender fluidity, et cetera. And I think about, oh my God, think about how many people would just feel so much better if they just never had to do any of the things that they thought they had to do to prop up a false image of themselves that did not make them happy. And that sure. is another one of the, the world's most boring stories that we tell all the time, but it just, it bears repeating. It does because there's just so much joy. So by like so, loosening yeah. up about no, it. Abso- absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and to, to be able to un, uh, to like open the doors for people to to not feel terrible about themselves. I mean, yes. that's all that's all part of it, right? Cuz the other thing that is uh, whether we know it or not is 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 just the conditioning and that we've created an ecosystem like a a, a when it comes to discussing things, let's just say Twitter is lacking in certain nuance, <laughs> you know. I uh, I mean, maybe maybe we could put it that way. Or 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 when people talk about something like you know, cancel culture or these like kinds of these these words that enter into our our lexicon and almost immediately. Well, it, it's like cancel your raping ass culture. So I'm well, not, no, not really going to stop it, a canceling. I'm going to keep on a canceling. No, absolutely. No, I don't even know if canceling does any good, though. You know what I mean? Well, that's but that's what that's what and that's what it boils down to is this thing of just like uh, the terms, the words that we invent, they they become almost meaningless. Yeah, people are upset about cancel culture, but two fucking words, Brett fucking Kavanaugh. Well, yeah, exactly. And there's no and there's no, uh, you know, did I say Brett Kavanaugh when I met Brent Kavanaugh? I can't even remember his name properly. He makes me so angry. I can't see the name. I'm like, yeah. there might be an N in it, but I, yeah, Kavanaugh, they're, they're... I can't even look right at it. It's like a fucking, I, I just want to kick through it. So I'm like, yeah, all right, we're going to, I, and I, well, so let, I just let had, me ask you I just this. had a, a tantrum on your show. I love it. I'm proud of it. You're welcome. Thank you for You're, letting yeah, me do I mean, that. Any any time, any time. I am curious though about the, maybe the the role of art in all, in what we're talking about because it becomes very easy, right, for an artist to be like, as an artist, it's my job to, and then like kind of do whatever stuff. But as a jo- as an artist, you do have a job, and you are and you are working, and you are creating something. I wonder if you know you've touched on the idea of almost you've touched on collective consciousness in one of the essays this idea that maybe like music is part of this thing that we all experience and maybe can experience together so so i wonder when you're thinking about your role in what we're talking about in essentially this idea that like we can break down some of these old notions let them die and replace them with less restrictive things. I mean, what role do you think music plays in any of that? What role do you think your songs could maybe play in any of that? I I don't know. I like I don't think anybody can say that about themselves. Like seeing well, yourself in the world on that map of yourself that I was talking about is virtually fucking impossible. It's so sure. weird. I've like I remember um in my 30s, I interviewed a couple of musicians that I that were like, you know, huge. Uh, they would be considered, I guess, you know, institutions of country music. They can't see themselves. Mm-hmm. They can't. And, and I remember asking this one guy, I was like, God, you're in the Country Music Hall of Fame. That's so cool. Like, God, do you ever just just look back and feel so incredible? And he just he, he could not it was just too it canceled yeah. it out he couldn't and you know he he had lots of answers because he'd been being he'd been interviewed his whole life since he was like 18 years old so he had plenty of answers but they weren't i don't know they they were just whatever he built around the weird tube that held the real him inside that he can't see because 
his eyes only face outward or something. I don't know how to describe that, but it, <laughs> sure, <laughs> maybe yeah, yeah, people yeah. can see themselves. I'm deaf. I definitely cannot. But through listening to other music, I can remember where I was at certain times because of certain yeah. music. Like I, lately, I've been on a real uh, Jane's addiction kick, and I I've remembered a lot of things. Is Jane's and Jane's really addiction? Good. Jane's Addiction rules, right? They're a great band. They fucking rule. Is you know, I I feel like I I kind of only caught the tail end, and and at and at that point, I wasn't a hundred percent sure if Jane's Addiction was like a cool band because I because they kind of seemed like just like a radio rock band. Well, they're when they're. I've, I think they probably got to a point where it was like we got to stay famous. Sure. And. It's really easy to talk about that sort of thing. Like it's really crappy and stupid, but I've never been there. I don't have any idea what that means. You um, mean like the notion that like I have to, we have to keep being We have to get plastic something. surgery. And yeah. I don't think I'm treading on anyone's toes because, you know, Dave Navarro literally had a show about like getting ready for his wedding with his wife. Like it was a reality show and some people can do that. I, I can't imagine it, but I th- I don't want to go that far with them. But, sure. and this is going to sound like I'm being a music snob, but like I was actually really into a band called PSICOM or SICOM, however you want to say it, which was Perry Farrell's first band. And I was a huge, I was really into them. Um, and then Jane's Addiction happened. And, you know, I, I think the other day I was reading some billboard thing about them and they were talking about the record. Um, uh, the Ritual, De Lo Habitual. Yeah. Um, but the first record is just that I had it on cassette and it's like a fake live record or is it a real live record? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and the sounds are kind of awkward and there's some overdubbing on it. So I'm like, I don't think like maybe it's part live. I'm not really sure. But me at 17 or 18 or however old I was when that came out did not give a shit. Yeah. I, it was the sounds of a man opening his throat and chest and voice and making long held notes that were really yeah. strident and really large like like how you know birds sing or yeah. cicadas make noise you know it's it's the same kind of thing and i remember thinking that i remember thinking that i felt i didn't feel so icky listening to stuff about women that they sang ever either i felt way more invited to their stuff than i normally did and that wasn't like a super conscious feeling that i had but i definitely felt closer to them at with my proximity as a human girl human being to their band like maybe they would talk to me if we were sitting on the same bus yeah yeah, where Wait, you, you know there were definitely people who would not give you the time of day, <laughs> and you're both super fucking poor, so it didn't make any sense. But yeah, there was a lot of really weird rules I remember that that were just totally localized, weird localized rules in, in like a music scene or about music, and I, I think things were probably very individual. To, yeah. uh, or not individual, but we're very localized too. Like there was, they were probably almost like weird traditions. Well, well, sure. So when you listened to Jane's Addiction, you felt like you heard something that was like a lot less constrained. Because when I listen to it now, like going back and realizing like uh, that there's this weird fusion of like weird hippie vibes with like kind of oh, a yeah. metal thing along with like that total rock. They let their God freak flag too. fly. Yeah, yeah, they're and like, freaky. Hardcore at that time was very white, very male. Yeah. And it sounds like I'm just making this up, but like I remember I went to rock shows all the time. Uh from very early on. And I remember when a when a woman would be in a band, the men around me would literally say out loud, chicks can't fucking rock. 
And a lot of them would say it like, oh, this is my cue. Here's the thing I have to say. Like, I remember seeing the obituaries once they were this really cool band from Portland and they came on and it was like an alarm went off and several like 17 year old dudes or dudes who are like 25 were like chicks in a band can't fucking rock just the and yeah it was so gross and i knew it wasn't true but at the same time i was like okay that i'm definitely like there's a barrier there i'm not supposed to be in there with them and i did really try to get in there with them anyway for way way fucking longer than i should have (laughs) Well, yeah, sure, sure. Because you, because, because you want. I mean, obviously, you're there because you like the music, so you yeah, want to be a and exactly, part of this. and like you know, yeah. you want to be around people who like the same music as you because you you think the music is cool and you want to talk about the music. Yeah, and yeah. I I remember like knowing guys when I was 16 years old, who if I said something about a song or a band, they'd look at me and just go. <laughs> and literally disregard. like there would be like three of them that would look at me like the fuck yeah. are you saying you fucking idiot yeah and i've actually had men say things like what are you saying you fucking idiot to me and <laughs> you know it was like the cruel times of you know being in high school yeah and junior high yeah. school and yeah there were some real pieces of shit out there and i, I was like is it like this everywhere? Because I was just a little too young for like the super awesome first wave of LA punk to come up the coast. Right, I, I right. kind of was finally old enough to be interested in music in the way that I would I would seek it out and want to go see it at like 14. And that was 1984. So yeah. I had to really break laws and rules yeah. to go see shows. And I really put my ass on the line to do it so i don't know i had every right to be there too well you yeah of course you had every right to be there i'm curious about the 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 kind of inner resolve it must take when you're met with that kind of like snotty rock you know rock dude mentality to just like keep showing up to shows to keep pushing through what what do you think i think uh, well my circle luckily for me like my circle was pretty rural and i was from an area where like frankly there was a shit ton of like people dabbling or so i thought in like skinhead kind of nazi shit like these were scared fucking white kids and they were they were shit heels and some of these kids were super rich and like I don't know what they weren't getting or thought was okay. Or I thought, okay, they're just trying to shock me is what I thought a lot of the time. Like, well, they'll like me eventually because like, I think my, the main person in my group of friends at that time was a really gregarious guy who did like women and thought women were cool and hang would hang out with them. But he also like, wouldn't stick up for women either so it's like i had to stick up for myself which probably was a good thing but you know when i look back at how long it took me i feel like i'm probably not a terribly intelligent person and i'm I'm glad i did it but you know there's no like there was no glory in that rising above none right yeah yeah well, so w- when did it start to feel for you like you had found something that wasn't shitty like that? I mean, like what what shows did you start to eventually, you know, as you join bands like you're in the New Pornographers? Uh, I know obviously that's not the first band. That's a little bit later down the road. But when did it start to feel like you were welcome or that you had created a space for yourself where you were welcome at least? Mm, full on welcome. Yeah, Mm, I think being asked to be in the new pornographers was a really big deal for me because I really like I was already friends with those every person in the band and you know I I knew them all but I also was a really big fan and I was a huge fan of Carl's uh, first band Superconductor still am Um, and also Zimpano and you know 
Dan Behar was this incredible writer and you know, John Collins had this studio and John Collins was always one of those, still is one of those people that is just like, he could care less who you are. If you want to talk about music, he cannot wait to do it. And yeah. has this incredible memory of everything he's ever really loved and still has that music fan sparkle like he's still willing to learn. There's a certain thing that some people have where they're still amazed and they're, they know they still have a lot to learn and they love it. That that kind of that kind of feeling was there. And so yeah. I think getting in that band did something just slightly different than the other bands I had been in. Yeah. Yeah. Not that there that is in no way shape or form uh, like diminishing what the other bands I had been in, they just did different things, but that I felt fully welcome within the confines of that band, yeah, but not yeah. necessarily in the world of music. How, do, how does it feel looking back? I mean, I was, as I was putting notes together for this, I realized that that first new pornographers album, uh, Hey, you tell me how old was, it is. No, 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 I'm not. Uh, what? <laughs> Well, what? Because yeah, like, it, oh god, don't say it. It, it was say. released in two thousand, but you it, it took a few years for it for it to even get made, right? So like ninety eight yeah. or whatever is when you started mm, making no, it. No, we started before that. Um, oh shit! Wow. Carl would know for sure, and yeah, and John Collins would know for sure, for sure, because um, I'm terrible at remembering dates. But like, I mean, I I knew all those guys from about ninety one on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I think to get exact dates, I would that would be a question for Carl or John because I'm not good at that. But no, for sure. I I guess what I, what I'm what I was sort of what I was aiming to get at at least was that like, you know, uh, lots of bands last for five years and put out a bunch of good records over the course of five years, and some bands last 10 years and then you know they fizzle out or whatever but the new pornographers just keep going and uh keep making like really good records and uh that's a testament or it must be a testament to the kind of internal relationship that you all have and and i just wonder what that what that feels like because i mean you've and then you've got your own your own band uh many of your players have been long time players as well so it seems like you like to get a a, a crew and kind of keep together as much as is possible. I mean, is that the, does that resonate? The, the committed open relationships of. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, exactly. I think that's really a, actually a very Canadian thing, and I think that I think that comes from living in a country that is one of the biggest countries on the face of the earth, and it has one of the smaller populations. So it is not yeah. terribly hard to meet a great deal of the musicians that are kind of in your. <laughs> you know, genre music scene over the course of a couple of years if you go on tour because yeah. the the populations just aren't that big. So let's say, you know, Vancouver in the 90s, if you wanted to be in a band, great. But you had to accept the fact that like, you know, the person playing bass is probably also in like four other bands. Yeah. And yeah, that's a yeah. good thing. Because, sure, you know, sure. uh, the, America was is very much about um, this weird kind of sports mentality. Like, where's the loyalty? What, are you gonna practice with them? Yeah. Um, whereas, yeah. w which I did not really have the experience of personally in America, but I saw a lot of people who did. And then yeah. I went to Canada and uh, these people that I was playing with we're all accommodating each other. Like, oh no, so-and-so rehearses that night, so we're gonna, and you know, people would live in band houses as they do in America too, like, but uh, there would be like a bunch of the same band that was also three other bands, and then some yeah. of the other people would live in the other band house. It was really quite the network. And yeah, it, it was very potluck, and you really had to, um, I don't know. It just felt so good. You weren't, you weren't rooting for other people to fail. It didn't seem like a, a contest of any kind. And I'm yeah. sure that was helped by the fact that the Canadian government actually gave bands money in grant form to, you know, be bands and make art and contribute to Canadian culture that it w somebody thought that was important in the Canadian government. And, 
So yeah. Canadian bands were played on the radio and Canadian bands were able to tour and get grants and get arts funding. And it made a huge difference. And they, in turn, could also, they also gave a lot of grants for Canadian bands to go around the world. Right. They understood the value of art and felt that, you know, modern music being made by younger musicians coming up was a very valid form of cultural expression. And they wanted, they didn't, they weren't threatened by that idea. And it was just yeah. such a great way to live. Can you imagine a, a, like a band in the United States getting money to be a band, let alone a band called the New Pornographers? No, I cannot. <laughs> Neither can I. Neither can I. Yeah, like Some... <laughs> no, we, nobody ever batted an eye about our name until I think we were doing some charity thing for like a children's hospital or something. And they're like, re- we will not take your money. It's like, have you seen us? This is... <laughs> What? No. Yeah. It is it's a, it's it is, a word. It is one of the great truly Somebody might great... look that word up, Jason. <laughs> yeah. They might look fi- up the <laughs> And then they'll find out what it means. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah no, no, no. I uh I know. It's kind of it is kind of awesome to be censored and be maybe the ba- I don't like besides Daft Punk, I don't know a band that are more clothed and less having sex than we are. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, Daft Punk are actually sexy wearing full clothes and we're just wearing a lot of clothes <laughs> all the time. I, I not having sex with each other. I think there might be some some kind of sexy stuff going on on the cover of Mass Romantic, though. So there's that. Yeah, I mean, that is pretty hot. But that's true. And it's re- and it's and it's like, yeah, photo realistic as well. No, uh-huh. it is. I, uh, <laughs> it's the most <laughs> awkward album I, cover. I, I love it. In a, in a funny way, though, I remember reading about new pornographers in, like, alternative press magazine or whatever and being mm-hmm. like, whoa, I bet they're, I bet they sound nuts. And then I heard it and I was like, this rules, but it didn't strike me as like, it was kind of like, it's kind of like when I hit, heard Kiss for the first time or I realized that I was hearing Kiss. I remember seeing photos of Kiss and being like, these guys must sound like the most terrifying, right? satanic, Thank you. like, scorched earth stuff and then one day like i was listening to the radio with my dad or whatever and they finished playing and rock and roll on. all night yeah yeah and they were like that's kiss and i was like hey hang on that's, a second you're like that's pretty darn pleasing to the ear <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and and so the new pornographers though a a, a a classier and funnier and better band than kiss in almost every regard i'm gonna go ahead and say it but um uh, i don't know <laughs> i don't know but I, I love I don't the duality that is Kiss or the triality. Yeah. They're probably it. I don't know. They're just. Could you be more flagrantly harmless and make people yeah. so <laughs> mad? I know. I know. It's I know. like they deserve some sort of Oscar for like lifetime achievement of making people mad. For sure. By, and, and- by wearing costumes, which is pretty awesome. And the funny thing is, Gene Simmons, I mean, he sucks. He sucks so bad. But he sucks the same way almost all of those rock stars of that era do. You know what I mean? Like, he's just, like, very open about it. He's like, I'm going to gross out Terry Gross. I, that's the worst segue I've ever done. Gross out Terry Gross. But um, you know what I mean. Uh, I do agree with you, though. I mean, you you like you like rock and roll music a lot. Is that uh, What kind of stuff did you have you spent the last year listening to especially as things have gotten weirder and there's been all sorts of back and forths have you found yourself reaching for for specific records that uh you could share Um, with us well i've kind of had a a weird love affair with like 80s who i got i got really really into 80s who and this is this is going to be a really super unpopular opinion but it's just it's a fantasy right like we like a f- like a person like me growing up in the 70s fame and tv and radio like that is something that was a concept that i i never like that's like that could be on another planet i literally sure. thought watching television that you know say it was 1978 and we were watching perry mason I just thought that was a different city. I didn't understand that what a decade was. So I thought like, oh, like Perry Mason, I think was Chicago to me. I'm like, oh, they're in Chicago and they film that in black and white. 
Yeah. And so fame and the concept there, like those concepts were so foreign. It was just like those people are rich and live really far away somewhere that I'll never go and I'll never see and I don't have any idea. So we have these weird relationships to these records, but like to me, I've loved the who my whole life. And, you know, I, as I didn't start listening to lyrics of, a whole lot of of music that I was hearing on like FM radio until in my 30s. And then I was like, that, is that what he just said? Or I will have known the lyrics to a song my whole life. And then I think about what he's saying and I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't know he said that. Weird. Yeah. yeah. Like, you better you bet where he goes and who's next. And w when he kind of compares himself with like, He's just like, check out my huge dick right here. <laughs> and you know what? It's a super sweet dick and there's nothing, you can't even deny it. And you're like, I know. <laughs> and it's, but if it's done right, it's kind of funny. Yeah, and absolutely. I think it is funny. And in this weird way, I think the who is all like, and I don't know anybody in the who. I don't know anybody who's ever worked for the who. And this is like, I mean this in the nicest possible way. I feel like the who is what could happen if we take toxic masculinity and disarm it. Like that's what it would look like instead of really horrible shit. And sure. I say sure. this as a person who has lots of toxic masculinity in my body and I have actually acted that way many times in my life. And I listen to that and like there's this weird like young fucking hot dude like who can't do anything wrong who's a super millionaire in me that goes fuck yeah i would have said that too <laughs> yeah totally, fuck totally. Yeah, Pete. but then you're like oh the harmonies are so beautiful right there that's so beautiful and like roger daltrey is singing as hard as he can and it's super weird if i yeah. sit and i think about it in a weird way but it's the most complete out of the box thing you can listen to too it's just like it is a fully formed creature i don't question it yeah but that's partly because i grew up with it i i question things now whereas that's like no that is music that's my go-to like that is the apple that just came off the tree it's the who there it is i don't yeah. think about it it's the who and it rocks and fucking bob o'reilly's on and we're gonna dance around the living room like there's nothing to think about it's one of the but one there of the is true, everything to think about yeah that's i mean yeah absolutely baba o'reilly one of the great rock epics i mean i don't think it yeah gets much better it, than that and i i feel bad because like i don't want to waste more airspace on baba o'reilly because everybody already knows we don't have to talk about baba o'reilly ever again yeah and it's just it's just a fact it's just in the air it's like the sun rises and sets we know yeah yeah, yeah. and but 80s who I don't know if I would know it if I didn't live during that era and listen to FM radio. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's yeah. got some very, very signature keyboard sounds that I always find really odd. And they're so, they really date themselves. But then I realize, well, that's the first time that that keyboard sound also was ever taken out of the box. That was the first time it was probably ever used or the second time they were the first people to get it. They used it. And there it is. And it didn't hold up so well when 900 other bands used it later, but it's not the keyboard's fault. But it's like the who did it first. Sure. What are you gonna do? And maybe it's not the greatest sound in the world and doesn't blend well with other instruments and sounds like a bizarre farty thing, but yeah, it's still this kind of not overly serious opinion uh, map of time. And it, it's really like, what do we do as human beings? We relate in that way yeah, with each other. And that's how we make friends and, you know. Yeah. Do you, do you find that I'm when just, you listen? I'm just going to say the most obvious shit to you, Jason, basically. It's no, like, I, let's lo talk. I love Bob it. Bob O'Reilly's really good. People like I'm to make it. friends with each other, Jason. I'm just going <laughs> to lay some knowledge on you right now. You're welcome. <laughs> friends are good. Jane's friends Addiction good. rocks. Jane's Addiction's uh, fucking awesome. Life is worth living. Uh get rid of the billionaires, send them to outer space. I mean, I think it's all pretty good. I think you've got it I basically it all just like out. wrote a Brooks and Dunn song. Yeah. yeah. But about right this second. <laughs> um, 
Well, I just go, totally dated myself with Brooks and Dunn there, but that's they're, who, that, they're I, a punchline that never stops giving. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's it's been it's been so great hanging out and talking with you. Um, before we go, uh, how has getting ready to play some some shows felt? Has that felt pretty good? <sighs> well. Right now, I'm still in the COVID protocol section, so it feels mm-hmm. really weird and tentative. Um, I don't feel any mental or physical reservations. I just know that I have to prepare myself for the disappointment of like, okay, that's not going to happen. And it's but for ten- the right yeah. reason, and it's going to be okay. Like, I mean, last year I had so so many shows canceled that it's okay. Like nobody mm-hmm. wanted it that way and yeah. you know i i do i do kind of feel bad like there's this weird litigious thing in our our american society where you know a lot of venues and bands don't can't really take take the chance on being full using full disclosure by going hey if we announce that this show is going to cancel before this date or before the government the local government tells us we can, we lose all of our, our, our employees will lose their unemployment insurance or whatever. Like they have to wait certain amounts of time. Like there's so much protocol and red tape. It's like nobody wants to just make an awesome show line up and and schedule it and schedule everyone to work and like rent the tour buses and do all these things and fucking practice and all this stuff and then cancel it. Yeah. And then not give you your money back. Like nobody wants to do that. And especially the smaller venues, I feel so bad because they're really fighting for their employees and keeping their doors open. And yeah, so absolutely. there's just so like, there's so many people who work in the music industry. Oh yeah. And yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not even talking about anything of, that's outside of, I'm not even talking about like major label. No, you're talking like Big people who, who run sound at a venue or somebody yeah. who, who slings drinks at the bar. Like these exactly. people, haven't, they haven't been able to do their jobs. They haven't been no. able to, yeah, and it sucks. And there's obviously just a billion complications that we could get into. But mm-hmm. I guess, I guess how, how about this? When you guys were able to like practice and get ready for the, for the shows, did that feel good? Um, yes. That did feel good. We still have more practicing to go. Um, yeah. But I guess I guess what I say is like we're just trying to do the bend like the reed thing. So if everybody would bend like reeds with us and maybe if the show's canceled, like if you call the venue or call us, be like, oh, we're so sorry. Hey, is there like we let us know when we can get things or just try try to be like even the not, like a, a word of like thank you so much for we know it's going to be okay like anything like that really yeah. helps everyone and yeah, you know absolutely. absolutely i i just like and the, you know the audience i i hate talking about stuff like that because you know we can't it's so fucking cliche like just pretend that i'm gene simmons right now like we can't do the fucking show without you <laughs> you know what I mean? If you don't show yeah. up, we're just practicing, man. Yeah. <laughs> you got to complete the circuit. You know, but it's true. And COVID has been so hard on people just getting that weird. And this totally goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of how do humans communicate that we don't notice? Yeah. It's like these weird, you know, social things that we do that fills up our our cells and gives us energy yeah. that we really need from if if live music is what it is that does that for you you need it yeah, like we need sure. to play music yeah and you know obviously it's something that i do cuz it pays the bills but also it would i would feel so shitty if i didn't and i and I am not feeling shitty right the second because I think I'm about to do it. So yeah. I'm trying to like really coast on that. But uh, we're going to go somewhere here. Yeah, it's going to be good. Absolutely. We're just trying to make sure lots of people don't get more sick. And that's For a sure. cool, that's a really cool thing to do. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like like you said, can't it, you know the audience closes the circuit. It's just like Kiss yep. always said, you know. So and it's like if we can go out back and just sneak one cigarette really quick and then go back <laughs> to work, like that's kind of what our rock show is going to be like. Hey, let's meet out in the alleyway. Let's try to get a couple of these in before. Yeah, that's great. Know? That's great. Well, and Nico, we'll fuel. Thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you for taking the time. It's always thank you for so me. much so much fun talking with you and uh and uh and hopefully we'll see each other on the road at some point i'll get out to a show indeed The Falcon Sedan 1969 The paper said 75 There were no survivors None found the mark Nico Case here on Transmissions. I'm Jason Woodbury. I write, host, and produce Transmissions. Andrew Horton edits our audio. Uh, we've got visual assets by Sarah Goldstein and Jonathan Mark Walls, and our executive producer and top of the show announcer, Aquarium Drunkard main man Justin Gage, who founded Aquarium Drunkard in 2005 and hosts the Aquarium Drunkard show on Sirius XM every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. PST. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, There are no shortage of things on the internet that that you could be listening to, uh, other shows, great shows. I want to recommend my friend Pam Grossman's podcast, uh, The Witch Wave, which featured a great interview with today's guest, Nico Case, very recently. Go check that out. That's uh, Pam kicking off the new season of her show. Uh, But as I was saying, I know there's a lot of stuff you could be listening to, so we appreciate you spending time with us here. Uh, If you really dig this show... Uh, you can help us out by spreading the word, uh, posting up uh, the pages on, on your social media. And of course, if you want to take your support even deeper, we're over on Patreon. Next week on the show, Damon and Naomi. Until we're back in the same zone, stay safe. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. On your face yanks my neck on the chain And I would do anything I would do